Okay, we are ready to get started. Thanks for coming out on a beautiful Saturday. We had a wonderful opening reception last night for this exhibition about Ray Johnson and Dick Higgins and the making of the paper snake. And today, today's program is called Snakes Escape. It will be a discussion with the curator Michael Von Otra, Julie Thompson, moderated by Brian Butler from UNC Asheville. Um, wanna, before we get into that, I want to just tell you about two events next week. The first is on Wednesday, and it is a presentation by David Silver, who is a scholar from California, from the uh, University of San Francisco. And that program is called The Founding of the Farm at Black Mountain College. David has done more work on that topic than anyone else that I'm aware of. And it's a free presentation. It starts at 7.30 next Wednesday. Then on Thursday, we have a poetry reading with two poets, Catherine Soniat and Catherine Stripling Meyer. That also begins at 7.30. They both have new books out. Uh, and Catherine Stripling Meyer is a former poet laureate of North Carolina. So I hope you'll join us for one or both of those events. And they're both listed on this card that you can find up front. Another, um, just to mention, these are free. It's a program guide to this exhibition. Uh, some really great and informative essays by Julie and Michael. And um, it's full color and free, so feel free to take one if you're interested in finding out more about the paper snake and the process of making it. And we just want to acknowledge our friends next door at Henco for uh, giving us a great price on the printing. To, and to Brian and his uh, UNC Asheville Gallatin Fellowship for helping to support it, and to an anonymous donor who also helped to support the printing. So right now I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, Brian Butler. Well, it's, the moderator's job is to be as quiet as possible <laughs> and have everybody forget that he's there or she. And hopefully that's what happened. That happened. I, I want to say one of the great things about being part of the museum is to be part of one of these things and the, the incredible energy that people like really Michael bring to the room. Um, and about the only person uh, I think I've met um, other than say, Alice that has the same kind of energy would be Dave Silver. <laughs> so um, it's amazing to be in a great week um, for uh, presentations on Black so I'm just going to introduce the two of them, and I'm going to get out of the way, and then they just get out of control. <laughs> in a bad way. Not in a good way, clearly it's going to happen, because the, the amount of enthusiasm is just infectious. It's just wonderful. So I'm going to introduce them both really briefly, and then we'll get out of the way. So first, Julie Thompson, who's an independent scholar and has done some amazing work on Ray Johnson. I know because she's done great work for the um, uh, Black Mountain College Journal studies journal, um, which is um, kind of part of it. So we're really thrilled. And uh, she's also um, uh, done uh, published stuff in the Believer, Blogger, Raw Visions, Archives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Huge amount of great work on Ray Johnson, and we're really thrilled. And there's Michael Von Plutcher. And he's, uh, this, this is, I'm, I'm reading straight out of the little catalog, except for one thing, which isn't in there, which is he did this wonderful show with the curator of the show, which is just amazing. So he's an archivist based in New York. I've been working since 1999 on various collections of material relating to Ray Johnson, primarily the official New York Correspondence School archive of William S. Wilson. Um, Ray Johnson's biography has been writing itself, naturally writing itself on his hard drive. Um, encouraged by a residency at the Emily Harvey Foundation in Venice in 2012, and correspondences with some of Ray's closest friends. And I know he just saw some uh, a new new correspondence just a few years ago. It's interesting how that bubbles up right here um, in history. But now I'm going to get out of the way, thank them for being here because it's thrilling, and let them go at it. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Um, to start with, there are some pictures of, of Ray from throughout his lifetime that I thought would be interesting for you to see. Um, that's Ray, who's he as a baby. 
self-portrait um, in high school. So it's probably 1943 or 44, or something like that. It's in the collection of uh, high school drawings, like the one that's on the wall over there. Uh, that is Rang Elaine Schmidt, who also was at that Mountain College. In fact, it was her sister going there that um, that interested Ray and um, and Elaine and Ruth Asau who all who all got to work out around the same time. So this is then at Oxbow in between their junior and senior years in high school. And yeah, nice and so, so this is courtesy of David Silver, who is speaking next week and will be a wonderful um, talk to him if you're able to. Um, but I think with all that we talk about Ray Johnson, we rarely get to see him on the farm at Black Mountain College. And so David found this in the archives. Um, he'll be showing it at his talk too, just so we will not forget Ray on the farm and that integral part of, of life. I think we thought this was Elaine um, met with him, but I think, you know, since the blonde hair. So if anyone knows who this person he's with, please let us know. That's by Hazel um, Larson Archer. There are two photographs of, uh, by her of Ray on the wall over there. Ray with Richard Lippold. Um, this would be probably 1949 or 50. I think they weren't there that long. It's an apartment that they had very briefly on 119th Street. The legend is it was an all white apartment, and Richard went away for the weekend, and when he came back, Ray had painted the entire place black. And, and Ray and Richard met at uh, Black Mountain uh, College, too, when history. Richard came and was a, a visiting artist, not quite an instructor. Um, that would be at the same apartment, probably. The piece that you see on the wall behind him is called Calm Center. It was in Richard's collection for many years. Um, and I'm not sure if I... Diana and Dave recognize the painting that he's working on. Does it still exist? No. Diana Bowers, is, <laughs> Diana Bowers is from the estate of Ray, works at the estate of Ray Johnson in New York, and um, uh, was responsible for helping Ray in, in, to a large extent with getting the show together. Oh, well, wait. Maybe, though, you should say the story about where Ray's early work ended up. Oh, that's right. We, we forgot to go into that history. Well, um, supposedly, he burned all his paintings inside all these fireplaces. So there's been like the Ray Johnson legend, there are a few of those. Um, Gerard Ford tells us that Sai Tuang Lee didn't have a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever version of that story is true, we don't know. We do know that there are very few paintings and that they probably were destroyed. That is by Norman Solomon, also Dr. Mountain College. Um, he was at the college after Ray, but they became great friends in New York. And I believe that they're at Coney Island. And uh, I think that his description was that those are dancers from Remy Charlotte's company, and I guess with a, a child that they came at the beach. And Ray is the one with the baby suit, the white baby suit rolled up. That is by Nick Cernovich, who also was at Black Mountain College just after Ray. Um, that is supposedly. Christmas 1954, um, when Ray worked at Orientalia. So again, these are images from before a lot is known about Ray. And Susie Galbeck, also from Black Mountain College. Um, these are works by Ray, um, his, what he called Motocos. And the photograph is by Elizabeth Novick, and it's um, on 1955. And um, there are stunning photographs of Ray and Susie, some of them in color, big um, arrangements of, of the motor coast. And according to Bill Wilson, after this was done, Ray took the, those, the motor coast that are in the photographs and burned them on the sidewalk as well. This is the, the photograph, there's a smaller version of that there. Um, it is on the cover of the paper snake. Um, but of course, we can only see it in that blue and aqua. So yeah, there. Yeah. The amazing thing is to see these collages because, um, uh, as far as I know, unless unless somebody recognizes something, they're long gone. Uh, Julie found another copy. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, another shot from the same from the same photo shoot. So it's a slightly different pose. Yeah. Ray's kind of facing more forward there. So, but Dick um, Higgins took these pictures of Ray. Oh, that's right. Thank you for saying that. 
Uh, that's by George, George Curtin's, and it could be about 1960, 62, something like that. Notice he has a beard. Mm -hmm. okay. That's Ray and, and the irrepressible Mae Wilson. The film that's on the, um, that you can watch, um, shows, I think, Mae wearing the same, the same braids hat. She was wonderful. Of all the Ray Johnson people, she would have been one that I really would have enjoyed having that. And Mae Wilson was Bill Wilson's mother, and so Bill first met Ray, and then kind of brought Mae into corresponding um, with Ray as well. It's a much more complicated and detailed story than that, but that's probably the, the light version. <laughs> Uh, that's by Bob Sakanich. He um, that the, the the dress model that is under his arm is um, a present for Mae Wilson and became a, an artwork of hers who I think still exists. That's by Marie. And the version of it that we have in the show. Ah there. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a little bit small there, so it's nice to be able to see it larger here. Uh, on the shelf right over a little bit that way is the paper snake, and that is um, Dick Higgins's um, Jefferson's birthday. That was the paper, that was something else past his first book with him, and, um, and the paper snake was the second one. There's Mary mm -hmm. Wilson again. This is the New York Correspondence School, school Stilt Walk on Halloween of 1968. Oh, the photograph is by John Willenbecker. It's unknown who took the photograph, except it bears a striking likeness to that one. If he's wearing the same shirt, I've never seen it as large as that. Anyway, it might be by Joe Fieldson who took that one, but um, I can't be sure. And that's just for fun. But is, um, is it Hazel's? Oh, yeah. Or is that John? Oh, okay. So yeah, that is Hazel Larson Archer's photo. Um, the the mm -hmm. remake of it, we think, is by Richard C. Although he didn't say mysteries, mysteries. <laughs> I mean, you would still didn't say. Well, he mailed something to me. So. But you would ask him a question. But the timing is complicated, so I, I don't know if it was a response or if it was just another mailing. So, yes. Postmarks are very valuable tools in this line of work. <laughs> yes, we don't have an answer, a definitive answer. Um, and then um, we brought some pictures of Dick Higgins um, just because The Paper Snake um, is a book of all the, uh, sorry, a book of many things that Ray mailed to Dick Higgins between 1959 and 64. Um, and so we just thought we should share a few photos of Dick Higgins. Um, this is Dick um, with his wife, Alison Knowles, um, both very active and known in the Fluxus circles. Um, I think if we go to the next slide, I believe it seems like Alison is preparing him for this performance, and I forget exactly which one it is. Um, but. Uh, Dick did many things. He was a very prolific writer, um, published a number of titles under Something Else Press, and as Michael mentioned before, The Paper Snake was the second book published by Something Else Press. Um, also, yeah, so, so such a writer himself. Um, maybe we'll go to the next section. Um, this is also, it's interesting how quickly these people change with beards or hair or no hair. Um, and so we've kind of tried to create a representation of some of those different faces of these, these individuals as well. Um, I forget exactly, too, which performance this is, but um, Dick, working with one that I believed involved um, guns. Um, and maybe the next one. So this is uh, kind of a close-up of Jefferson's birthday and postface. And this is the first book that Dick published with Something Else Press. Um, and we have to keep in mind that if you have the book one way, it said Jefferson's, post, um, Jefferson's birthday. And then if you flipped it over, it says postface. So it has a book with two covers, and then the texts are, are back to back. So it's two books together, um, which has kind of a duplicity 
um, that is kind of interesting as well. And then uh, Ray Johnson's The Paper Snake was the second book. And Dick wrote this uh, Something Else Manifesto. And we have it in one of the drawers in the, in the exhibit. And Ray, or Dick said that when he founded Something Else Press, he thought he would publish a book by Ray Johnson. That was kind of integral to the founding of Something Else Press. And uh, Dick only published his own book first is because George Machunis, one of the ringleaders of Fluxus, was being too slow to publish it. So um, if you're not sure how to get your books in the world, start a press, publish your own, publish your friends, and go from there. <laughs> Ask us. OK, well, I have a list of questions. So I get to, I get to do something. That's awesome. OK, so um, actually, this would be one for both of you. And this is uh, kind of uh, what started your interest in Ray Johnson research. And how did that feed into this? Would you go first? I, was, I, I, I confess I don't really know what actually having you. And this is, I'm very excited to hear Michael's answers. We, we talk about many things, but we also we don't get to talk about these things. Um, so I think the first that I heard about Ray Johnson, I'm from Michigan, and um, I heard about the documentary How to Draw a Bunny, which is going to be shown um, later during the exhibition here. And I just was blown away by what a unique artist he was. Um, he's just unlike anyone else. And then it had the kicker up, he's from Detroit. Um, and so being from Michigan, it's like, how does someone become an artist like Ray Johnson? And I think that's the question that I've been continuing to explore. Um, so I think I saw it, the movie came out in 2002, as I recall. And I think I saw it sometime like 2003, 2004, but I can't remember where. It might have been on DVD. My friend said it was at the DIA. I'm not really sure, um, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, but I told my friends about it, and so then they saw it. Um, so that's a kind of a good, if you don't remember, maybe your friends will remember. Um, and then the first person who I really contacted, so I wrote about Ray and his books and his nothings first in 2006, and then I contacted Diane Wachowski, because um, she's a name that comes up in Ray's A Book About Death. Um, which we might talk about a little bit more. Um, but she lived in, Mich in East Lansing, and a friend of mine knew her. And so that's, if you can start with a friend of a friend of someone to contact and write a letter. Um, and so she graciously met with me. And part of that was, I don't remember a whole lot. Because <laughs> I was like, your name is on this page. Did you have a cigar band collection? No. <laughs> so it's, you know, even when you're exploring these things, you know, and you can find the people and you can talk to them, you know, memories are hazy. But um, she was the first person who I spoke to. Um, Carl Worsum was the second. Um, so Carl Worsum drew um, at least one of the snakes um, in this grouping over here. His name's on it. He's the artist active with the Harry Hoop group in Chicago. Um, and then finally I wrote Bill Wilson. So, and I was presenting a paper in New York, and Bill, and I kind of connected with Bill, and Bill loaned a number of works in the show, long time uh, preserver of the Ray Johnson legacy. Um, more things would have been burned or thrown away if it were not for Bill. Um, and so I think that kind of led to a whole new, and then I met you soon after, too. So I think I've been... All of those things kind of led, but I keep the conference that happens every year here is a fantastic opportunity to always explore some different side of Ray, so. I was working for a dealer of artist books uh, from 1990 until 2000 when she died of cancer, but near the end, I went to a dinner on her behalf, and one of the people there was Bill Wilson, and somebody thought that we would enjoy talking, and we did, and Bill asked me to go out to dinner with him and discuss Ray Johnson, and I just remember going back to his house, which is like the Adams family lived there, or it's the May Wilson Ray Johnson Museum, it's a, it's a, it's a place that knocks your socks on. And so I remember being very cool with Bill, really wanting the job, and so we get to his house, and he has an areaway, kind of a little, uh, a little entryway front yard sort of thing and it's a couple steps down from the sidewalk and it has a, a metal fence across it 
unbeknownst to me, it, one of the sections of that fence was a door that swings. So I bring Bill back to his house, and I'm trying to appear professional and so forth. And I leaned against what I thought was that fence, and it was the part with the gate, and it dumped me <laughs> right onto the onto the ground, basically, in front of his, Bill's house, where where um, where Bill was being mugged, and Ray Johnson saved him, and has the broken nose pictures. Of his. <laughs> anyway, so it almost I almost broke my own nose there, um, but Bill and I still hit it off. Uh, and then gradually I realized that a lot of the people that Bill was friends with that were part of the Ray Johnson circle were people that I had started corresponding with 10 years before um, through my job with artist books. So it was kind of an amazing set of, of, cir of circumstances and, and, and surprises and serendipity and stuff. And now it's 15 years after I started working at Bill's. I've done some work at the estate of Ray Johnson also. And, um, at some point, I like to think I'll get done with Ray Johnson, but, um, but you know, the biography is happening. I have a collaborator, and so hopefully within the next five to ten years, there will be a Ray Johnson biography if there ever has been. I think that we also found out, didn't we, uh, and correct me if maybe my memory is bad, but aren't we both, didn't we study communications? I did. That's right. Yes, so we discovered this. So we think there is something to that. I have a master's in art history that I got later, but I think it's these exchanges that really somehow fascinate us to the root, too, and all these people. Mm. Yes. Okay. okay, then we'll leave up with this question. Uh -oh. By the way, they fed me these questions. <laughs> these are questions from them. And that's why they're very good because of that. So, so I'm going to go to this one because you actually led us there quite beautifully, which is, is you know, the idea of community in Ray Johnson. So the way he's constantly creating correspondence and community. And you seem to be part of it now. And, and so can you discuss how community works in the work of Ray Johnson? Or how you well, I think, you know, one thing of just, we kind of, I mean, we, we could have shown you so many photographs, and, and Michael has amazing collections and has seen amazing photographs over the year, but we did make a particular effort to put all the people that Ray met at Black Mountain College, um, or who met in those extended circles of Black Mountain College alums who went to New York or other, mostly New York, and he, he kind of connects with those people in those ways. And I feel like that's very much how this work, as soon as you start talking to one person, then, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? Oh, you should meet this one. Or just one opportunity leads to another opportunity. And then you have this group of, you must probably have hundreds of people that you can be in touch with about all these things that you met. You know, Bill Wilson always seems to have someone else there. So you're always meeting someone else if you get to visit, when I visited him, um, which is fantastic. And I think it's, it's also all this, you never know what happens when you put two things together, or just what relationship can be created. Um, and sometimes that's people, sometimes that's things, sometimes it's things connected to people. Um, and, it's, it's, it is this amazing, a community does develop, and I mean, it's a, you can, community is kind of this big term, but I think there's all these people I've met because of Ray Johnson, that if I didn't have Ray Johnson as a reason to meet them, I don't think I would have met. I bet you and I probably would have been, but never met, if not. Well, that's true. You know? Yeah, no, that's true, and, and like I said, I would say the same thing. That there are lots of people that have come to know Ray Johnson that I couldn't have known otherwise. Um, it's funny because people don't, well, not a lot of people, people don't just hear of Ray Johnson and like him. They come up, not obsessed, but, but people that are into Ray Johnson, there's a, a, a high percentage of us become real, really into Ray Johnson. And then, yeah, I do. There are a number of us that are in communication constantly and sharing the fruits of each other's research efforts and so forth. But yeah, so I think those networks that he was building at the time of, he would do mailings that, you know, oh, please send this to someone. And so then those people get connected. But those networks are continuing, even though he's not with us, but because of our work. Or, oh, you're interested in this part of Ray. Let's talk about this. And then it leads to something else, too. So. 
Do you think that Black Mountain fostered that in all of its students that, that kind of, I mean, it was such a special community, and we hear lots of stories about, oh, well, they left, someone said left Black Mountain and went to New York and roomed with someone, you know, someone that, that, that it, it was a, a catalyst for a huge community of, of artists. And, and the point that you made is, is very good, that, um, that even if those introductions happened at Black Mountain, a lot of them were continued in New York. And actually, um, come to think of it, I mean, Ray met Richard Lippold, and the two of them were obviously had a, a relationship for many years. But then um, uh, not a lot of, a huge number of people that were at Black Mountain College at the same time as Ray were part of the community of his closer friends. But Norman Solomon went there after and met Ray in New York and uh, Stan Vanderbeek and come up with a... a, a John Cage. Well, yeah, well, they, they did meet at, at yeah. Black Mountain. But yeah, a number of people, Susie Gavlick and so forth, so they, they, they have a Black Mountain College shared background, but that's not where they met. But there, there was still this, this connection even all the way up to New York. Yeah, and I think um, I think the big part about Black Mountain is that you know Ray came here when he was 17, and and so he was very young, and so it was the beginning of a world for him, um, and just meeting, I you know when you meet a like-minded person or someone who challenges you or gives you new ideas or has unique approaches then you can kind of bounce off each other in a way. And so I do think, I don't think it works for everyone. Not everyone was friends. I'm sure, you know, the, there's enemies to, you know, Black Mountain College that we don't talk about. But those places where people connected, that energy that resulted um, continued as they moved. And I think some of it's simple as like, I'm moving to New York, where should I live? Which is hard. Um, and that's, that's in a time of, Oh, you should look up this person, and that's probably like a Black Mountain College connection. So I think those, but then also because they were like-minded or interested in ideas, or you know sometimes performing in same places, or you know going to each other's openings, it continues too. Um, and I think too, uh, you'll know the right address, but the Boza Mansion was John Cage lived there, Merce Cunningham, Richard Lepold had studio space and Ray lived there as well. So they're all living in the same building too, um, which is some of the, when you get really deep in, you'll know all this stuff. But you know, I mean, for anyone who's just starting, like they're living in the same places even when they're in New York, so um, sometimes. And, and Ray and Norman also lived, they never lived in the same building at the same time, but they lived on the same street near each other. And maybe we should mention too, Norman Solomon, so went to Black Mountain College, but he's the one he and Bill met, right? And then Norman's the one who introduces Bill Wilson to Ray. So, you know, these circles and community, but that's also one person introducing another person to another is how we all get connected, too. So. There was this wonderful moment at Black Mountain College where uh, in the correspondence that Ray sent to his parents, uh, the, the 1948 spring semester was going to be closing and it would be time for him to leave. And Joseph Albers says to him, no, you should stay for the Summer Institute. There will be some really interesting people coming here. Boy, that was an understatement. And that, him staying there for that extra summer, well, he meets Richard Lippel, he meets Don Cage, he meets the conservative, and becomes that famous. And if it wasn't for that conversation with Joseph Albers saying, stay, he wouldn't have been the same Ray Johnson. So, what I would love to hear from both of you is um, the paper snake. I mean, what, what do we need to know about that specifically so that we can walk around this exhibition and really feel like part of, part of the community? <laughs> the paper snake is very, is a, uh, it's complicated because um, it doesn't meet the traditional definition of an artist book. Wasn't it's not an artwork conceived of in book form by Ray Johnson. It is a compendium of his work by Richard, by, by uh, sorry, by Dick Higgins. 
And um, so that disqualifies it from a lot of what the book arts are, are supposed to, to be. But it's still, it's an amazing thing. If you have to look at it as an uh, artist book done by two people in collaboration, Dick and Ray, um, maybe that's a way of doing it. Keep in mind, as, as from some of the text that I think it implies, the paper snake came out and um, it was met with mixed reviews as an understatement. It was met with a lot of, people didn't understand it. It didn't sell well. There were still a few hundred copies Almost a third of the paper snakes that were printed were still in the warehouse when the press went bankrupt in 1973. Um, and, it's, and yet, here it is 50 years later, we're talking about it as a classic artist book, although just about all of the books from this something else press, maybe not all, but a lot of what they did, did go on to become really recognized. And so, yeah, the paper snake is, um, it's problematic in, in a couple of ways. It's nice to be able to see from all of the production material exactly how it, it evolved. Uh, and I, with all this work that I've been doing on this show and just in general, I still don't, I mean, there's still things about the paper snake that, I, that I'm learning and, and don't understand. Yeah, I think I tried to avoid this book for as long as I could. <laughs> um, because it's a little maddening. Um, and I think another thing is, I, I, I remember coming across it in the library. I totally photocopied the whole thing. Um, and I just, you know, Ray's mailings are a whole world, and you, they're kind of a, a rabbit hole, and you could spend thousands of years in them. And you don't have thousands of years. So I was just like, I'm not quite sure what to do with this. Um, but the great part is I heard Michael had the very early ideas of, of putting this exhibit together, doing an exhibit, because he had found um, the, the proof sheets um, at Bill Wilson's, they, they'd emerge, um, and so that's kind of, it seems like that's the impetus too, right, of, oh, here's all this material that no one's seen, no one's talked about this exhibit, Valentine's Day of this year was the 50th anniversary. These all seem like signs of there should be an exhibit, and there is. Um, uh, Siglio Press has just done a reprint of the book too, so now the book is more in circulation again, um, which is great. And also the Black Mountain College Conference that happens every year, the theme was poetry. And I was like, how do I wedge Ray into that theme? Um, and so he has some great things of, uh, that he says about not being a poet, being classified as a poet, or that sort of thing. Um, so I think like for all of those reasons, it's easy to ignore this book. And if you want to do that, it's OK, because that's where I started. But Michael has given you many reasons not to ignore it. Um, and so I think in some ways, that we're hopeful that all of our kind of digging into it might, might allow more people to dig into it. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's people who've known this book and that sort of thing. But I guess another point I want to make is this is the format of a children's book. Um, and so there's something, exactly how that decision, we're not completely sure, but Dick you know, talks about specifically, this is the format of a children's book. And there is something lovely, I think, of let me read this to you. Um, yeah, so, and, and we have a picture of Ray reading it to Dick's twin daughters, Jessica Higgins and Hannah Higgins, um, up there. But, you know, so I think, just to, for anyone who hasn't yet engaged with this text, um, we'll make you do so now. Um, so this is Neckties Today 2. Um, neckties Today, number one, Regatta, number two, Taylor, number three, Orange, number four, Black, Number five, all silk. Number six, chipmunk. Number seven, Irish linen. Number eight, yellow. Number nine, mass bomb. Number 10, thin black. 11, black. 12, black. 13, tailor. 14, all set, silk. 15, all silk. 16, black. 17, pink. 18, marathi. Maybe we'll just put that back. <laughs> but it's fascinating. The deeper you dig, the, the more the more questions it raises. There, the the press run of the reprint 
is 1,840 copies, exactly the same number that were produced in 1965. So it's going to be really interesting to see how long it takes for this edition to, 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 to go out of print. Was there no direct connection between the emergence of the source material after 50 years sitting in Dick Higgins' house and the reprint of the book? In other words, the one didn't instigate the other? When I heard that it was being reprinted, I vaguely remembered a big envelope that said oh. paper snake in the back of one of Bill's file drawers. And I thought, wow, what if it's... And it turned out that there had been a search for it and nobody, not even me, not even Bill, knew that they were there for 50 years. And, and so the reprinting uh, instigated you finding the envelope. Yeah, so the, the reprint is done from scans from but which they would have had to have done anyway because it wasn't it was before digital files and things like that. But no, the material was found, was found while it was in production already for the second time. And as a press, Siglio is very interested in the visual and kind of the literary, those two coming together. So Ray is is an example of a, an artist that that marries those in such a powerful way. And then they were publishing the Not Nothing collection that's also available back there. Too. So I think they were publishing that book, and somehow the paper snake was also decided to be published too. Um, I'm curious, Michael, you talked last night, and you also mentioned today about um, the collaborative relationship between Dick and Ray on this and other things. Um, and because of that, the lines of authorship and intent in specific pieces within the work are, are muddy or, or clouded, um, and that's really interesting. But I'm curious about um, how Ray, what we know, what we've discovered about how Ray may have felt about the publication of the book, his opinions, his thoughts on the finished product, and also um, what opinions we might know that he had on specific publication decisions on pieces within the book. I mean, I know that's not the easiest thing to get at because he was so obfuscating in many of his works, but there's a great letter, and I think it's in that case over there, from Dick to Ray on the launch party and copyright. And I wonder, do we have that way of great response to things like that? No, in a lot of cases, not. There are some, um, Bill Wilson will tell you that there was a lot of contention between him and Dick. Obviously, the Ray's work looks so different in the book, and the texts having been having been typeset are, are so different from what they must have looked like when they were sent. Um, Bill knew Ray at the time, and can tell you that, that there were many episodes where Ray was really upset, as a, even with the title. It, it wasn't even supposed to be called that. It wasn't Ray's title. Um, but luckily, in a way, none of that survives in writing. I, 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 <laughs> For the, uh, the Journal of Black Mountain College Studies is doing a, a special issue for the paper snake, and so I was looking at correspondence between Ray and other people from the time. And so I know that there's this undercurrent, but Ray didn't write it uh, about it to people. If, if he did, it would have made the show somewhat different. I mean, there were letters from Ray in there saying, God, I hate this book, it's awful. I wish I'd never, I wish I'd never embarked on it. Really terrible. Um, Dick says that at some point Ray became decided that he liked it. I think Dick brings him to the, to watch it coming out of the press, and that was the moment that turned the turned Ray's opinion. It's I wonder. You have to think. Look, what would have happened if Ray had said somewhere along the line, the way, no, forget it. I I, I don't want to do it. Which is very. It would be a very Ray Johnson thing. To that um, but yeah, there is, there is, I'm finding bits and pieces of correspondence of, of, about how he really felt about it, but um, uh, he writes Dick a letter that I think is, has one sentence of thanks. He said, Dear Dick Higgins, Ray Johnson is an, a, 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 an artist most deserving of recognition. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. The, the, we, there are so many questions about how it got to the final form 
and as Michael kind of mentioned last night for anyone who wasn't here, but the book begins and ends with a Valentine. It came out on Valentine's Day. Uh, Dick's book, Jefferson's Birthday, begins and ends on April 13th, um, one year apart, on Thomas Jefferson's birthday. So that choice to put a Valentine at the end, which is not in those that proof edition, seems like maybe it was a choice made by Dick. We don't know though, you know. So, but I think there's certain things of how much did Ray know? How much was he involved? What choices did Dick make? I also <coughs> really wonder of like how this made Ray approach things that came after. And you know, even uh, at the end, he puts this ad for his uh, book about death in the end papers of the book, which it's kind of like, okay, this is Dick Higgins's book of Ray Johnson. Okay, here's this book that Ray Johnson is working on. He he has an ad for it in here. So I, I just this I, this intrigues me too. And I don't I don't think we can know these things, but just this is an advertisement for a book that Ray does kind of in the midst of starts it while this is in production. Um, but he has total control over that. So um, I think the one thing that we do know, he does say in an interview, this is why oral history interviews with artists are priceless, um, but also sometimes we always have to think about their context. But there was a special edition of the paper snake. So there were the 18, 1,840 copies of the regular edition, then there were 197 copies of the special edition, and there's one on view, um, but a small collage piece was, was put in there. We don't know where this idea for the special edition came from, um, but Ray does say that um, that, that upsets him um, in the oral history interview in the Archives of American Art. Um, and he says, he's like, this is a quote from Ray, but he says, um, that upsets me very much because the magic wears off. It gets out of my hands into someone else's hands, and I can't really get, you know, it's part of me. I can't get that back without doing something illegal. So, you know, I mean, I think that idea of the gift and what those collages, or how Ray sent things to people or specific people or asked people to send something to, there was a great intentionality that he hoped to control and have control over. Um, and it seems like that was one thing that is, that is preserved, you know, in the discussion around this book, that it doesn't seem like he totally felt was quite right. But then I think anything that comes after, we should think about, like, how, how, how hold hard and fast he holds to certain positions, or I do not want my work displayed this way, or it must be in this frame, or you know, like all of those relationships that get introduced, he he is very specific about lots of things, and I th I just wonder if that grows out of some of this experience yeah. too. Eventually, later in his life, he refused to exhibit his work anymore in commercial galleries, and eventually didn't uh, stop exhibiting at all. Um, he would only, I, I think. When, he, when asked if he would show something, he said, okay, but it would have to be nothing. It would have to be nothing in the gallery, and that would be the show. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate control. <laughs> but also, good for Dick Higgins getting this book in the world, so. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess I have a kind of an elemental question. I don't know much about this book coming into it. So did you say that these like everything in it was maybe pulled together by Dick Higgins from things that Ray sent him that weren't necessarily initially intended to make a book? That, that's exactly, okay. that's exactly. And, and um, they, they start with um, things that, um, they meet in June of uh, 1959, apparently, it seems. And so it's everything that was mailed or given or left in the sink, I think he says, or how, yes, but it was never intended to be, it was never, they were never intended. But I think there does get to be a point where Ray, Ray and Dick have talked about doing a book. Mm -hmm. You know, or Dick has said, like, I want to do a book. And Ray's like, okay. And then Ray does start mailing certain things that he's like, oh, this should go in the book. I think maybe, we think maybe the high school drawings could be some of that, maybe. Right. There are postcards in, in that case. You'll see they have Ray Johnson texts on them. If you turn them over, they are pre-printed, pre-stamped postcards, and they have Dick Higgins rubber-stamped 
address. So it seems like Dick mm -hmm. gave him a stack yeah. of postcards that he could write texts on and return to him. So yeah, at some point there's that there's that switch. Whether any of the texts in the paper snake came out of that or not, um, there's no way of knowing. And then Dick does mash up texts from mm -hmm. Ray. And there's a great, in one of the cases, there's a great kind of separation of two texts that then Dick can find in the printed version. So there's a lot of changing that happens between the originals too and what's in here. And then there's some printed work directly. I have a question, um, basically, about how you've been able to make the negotiate your roles as, as curators or scholars when you're working in a body of work, I should say that I mean to Ray Johnson as well, um, but when you're working in a body of work where he seems so intent on destroying it, I just wonder how you're able to navigate that. It seems, it seems very tricky. It's, it's problematic a lot of times, mm -hmm. let me tell you. I don't know, do you have to... Do you, well, I'm sure both of us go on these goose chases trying to figure out. It's, um, Ray did his best to be very difficult to be able to, to put things in order later on. Uh, we're also trying to do it 50 to, to 75 years after, and people's memories aren't what they used to be, and so forth. A lot of times I can, I can collect different people's accounts of the same, of the same event, they are so different from one another, and so it, for the biography, that I, all I can do is stack them up <laughs> in a row, and one of them is right, or the truth is some combination of all of those. But um, yeah, I've learned that you can never say anything without saying "may have" or right. "is thought to have," or because anytime I say something. <laughs> It, 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 there's a very good chance that it'll be superseded. And we shouldn't have wall labels in the show. We should have little, they should be in pencil, so <laughs> erasing those. Um, and, and bizarre things happen when you're dealing with stuff. So, so that was relatively a long time ago, historically speaking. In the Black Mountain College dossier, um, there are reminiscences by Ray's friends in the back. And there is one by Robert Rauschenberg, and there's one by Suzanne Vile. And they are very specific. They remember Ray as this in Albert's classes, and there are little descriptive things about that. They weren't there. They at just, the same time. They were yeah. not there at the same time. Ray left at the end of the summer of 48, and they came sometime in the, in the fall of 49. And yet both of them have these very specific memories that, that are impossible. That, that can't be, and so yeah. What do you do with stuff like that? But they are, they're, um, yeah. That's just one example. I'm sure you have plenty of them. It's a lot of guessing and frustration sometimes, and learning, like I said, the hard way. Never say anything definitely. <laughs> you you get yelled at when you say things definitely, and I, and I mean that in the best way because I think sometimes I forget because I'm like this piece of says it's true and so I guess my approach has been to kind of focus in on Ray and someone else so I've written about Ray and Joseph Albers, Ray and George Brecht, um, Ray and Alvin Lustig and um, kind of now Ray and Dick Higgins again saying that I've written about them I've written about very small slices and pieces and trying to focus in or hone in on something um, but kind of using something that I found in an archive and I think there are these moments there's these moments where there are these archival traces um, that Ray probably might have, could have, would have destroyed if he could have, but he couldn't because they were in someone else's paper or like the Black Mountain College records. Um, we have, you know, his student records and so we can see what courses he, can, he took, um, what teachers have said about him and things like that. So that's an institutional record. Um, you know, so just all the ways that this information about someone gets preserved. Um, and so I think it is very much of trying to do the best with what you have. 
also knowing that when you put this into the world, someone will say, hey, did you ever know about the response letter? And you're like, great, let's weave that in the next time we get a chance to do that. You know, and so I think there is this growing and changing to everything that Ray did, but that I guess needs a space in the scholarship too of how can you keep updating it? But I think, you know, you try to do with the best in the moment that you're in to present what, what is known to the extent that it is known. And, and I think there's a part where like Ray becomes conscious of the archive and you know Bill Wilson actually sends out a questionnaire of the, it's like the Ray, I'm forming the New York Correspondence School Archive? Yeah. Yeah, and so he, he tries to collect some information. Some people cooperate, some people do not cooperate. Um, and so there's various responses, but also Ray starts becoming aware of, oh, Bill is saving this, or if I send this to Bill, it will get saved. Or if I send this to someone else and tell them to send it to Bill, it'll get saved. You could probably say more about that. But, but yeah, there was a, a deliberate, a, a, it was a deliberate effort to have this archive, whatever it was, um, left behind. But it's by no means, oh, let's see, it's whatever it happened to get there, but then Bill will also tell you, Ray would suddenly walk in the door and say, I want to do you go over, pick up a box and leave with it, and then disappear from the archive. Forever. So there's that. There's an unfortunate, uh, as time goes on, I've seen this over the 15 years that I've been working. Every year I have to take people off my list because they're no longer with us. And another time goes by and I'm like, darn, if I could only have interviewed that person and uh, had that chance to come back, it does happen every year. What about his work? Uh, he sell. Uh, his work. I mean, I'm asking this because I'm thinking you guys are making me think about this discussion in a recent New York about royalties and when artists work or be so and there's a discussion going on about whether they should get royalties. You know. uh, and I'm wondering about if his work you mean, and maybe I, I've heard the same thing, you're, um, you're Ray Johnson and you sell a collage for $100 to somebody. Years go by and it goes to auction for a few million dollars and you are the artist probably needing a little bit of that money in your later years and how, how to make that. Yeah. Um, Ray's stuff was very emphatically given as gifts, except for the collages that were made specifically to be in exhibitions, and they're a very different scale and, and look very different. Um, and maybe I just, I want to jump in, because I think this is something that I've understood more and more and more recently, but kind of Ray had, they're not completely distinct, but they kind of are, they're kind of two tracks of working, and it's kind of loosely mail art in the correspondence school, but that also includes like the exquisite collages from Bill Wilson's collection that are artworks, but you know, Ray originally mailed those to him. Um, and then he did have these more gallery type works. And he does comment in an interview of kind of like, I have my gallery work and then I have my mailings, but, you know, and that's very loose. But you know, so there are these things that can be shown in a gallery that are bigger or, you know, we saw some early paintings was working on and who's the fancy person um, it's it's a, a big name who buys the letter world painting do you remember oh um, I'm sorry but you have to stop yeah I'm so bad at names um, she was the, the head of the um, of the of Mona's board or the Nets board and she had a last name Rockefeller it wasn't a Rockefeller maybe it was anyway it was somebody with a, a large I'm sorry <laughs> It's one of these names. Is Rockefeller Van Gogh? I think it was a Mrs. Rockefeller. Okay, John D. Mrs. John D. Rockefeller. Yes. Okay. Sorry. There's so much information. It takes us a while sometimes. <laughs> but you know, so she buys a painting of Ray's in a gallery in the '60s. Um, you know, and so he is selling some of his work in the gallery, but he is also creating a number of these works too, in a way that's not as directly related to money, right? Because certainly the smaller ones arrive at bills in envelopes, in the mail, 
and, um, and where it's headed is it's in that. that you could write volumes about Ray's relationship to marketing and, and the, the art world and how he tried to sabotage it in every way he can. And the story of the Mark Jack the Mark Janklo collages, a collector asks him for a 25% discount to buy if he buys everything. Right? Cuts 25% off each <laughs> <laughs> collage. And stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, That's in the How to Draw a Bunny film. So if you haven't seen it, it's a great scene. So And that the back and forth, too, of the exchange about it. So. It's an interesting question. And like I say, that it could be an entire, do a whole presentation on Ray and the marketplace. There's also not one way to answer kind of anything about Ray Johnson. That's also kind of what this question, you know, like I think you can't quite pin him down to, you know, because he's always changing and he's constantly in motion. And, you know, some of his early works he would chop up and then create into new works. And so there's some works that you can see that have multiple dates and multiple years on them. So it's this continuous change um, that is also kind of, you know, like, life and you know are you the same person you were a year ago no things change so the uh, title what is the source of the title what does that mean i do not know <laughs> that's um it was probably uh, it was probably given up by dick there's ray wanted it to be called Papa R. Snape for a while. And there's a piece back there that has that, and it's mentioned in several letters. Whether that's because Dick Wade wanted it, was calling it Paper Snape, and Ray said, no, we should call it Papa R. Snape, or whether Ray wanted it to be called Papa R. Snape, and Dick changed the title to make it a little more marketable. But that's not. Where are the snake rings on that? Snakes are a very big thing. But appear throughout. Except in the book. Yes. <laughs> but but I do think that Michael has found a, a great letter that's in, I think it's that case, but you know there's a letter from Dick that says, will you write out the paper snake by Ray Johnson? So Ray does seem to write out this title, you know, so there is that. Um, the typescript says the paper snake. Uh, and the galleys say the paper state. The galleys have a date on them of, of October 1964, so the, the type script must have been before that, and already it was called the paper state. But why is that doing it? It's an observation. When you look at this, and it's two parallel themes, and is, is he equivalent, you make it equivalent that he is a paper snake? Because he is snaking his way through the art world, through paper, and then that kind of like, you know, uh, conceit could be part of what's going on. But the other thing is, is that because it has all these different communications, in a sense, this function as autobiography, that these are his, this is his life he's putting out there. But then at the point where it becomes a product, then it becomes biography. And of course, people are always upset about biography, how that's contained. So that, that, that's part of it, because um, how, how he weaves his way through all, all, all of these communications is very complex. But it's, you can see that you continually your life is growing, and I think that's it, it's it's possible. Well, well, what is interesting is is that the format that you're talking about seems to uh, it seems to it seems to be connected. You look at Gertrude Stein, and you look at some of these the French writers that would do the, these type of fragmentary things, and then you look what comes after when postmodernism was in vogue and they were doing all this stuff. You saw all these quirky publications that came out with all this, you know, poetry and images and all that stuff, the same type of format. And then I do have to say, you talked about the children's book. Well, this seems to uh, be a precursor to Remy Charlotte's masterpiece, Arm and Arm, which is a similar collection of different images and plays and poems and everything. And it was a children's book. Yes. Well, it, it's a children's book, but it, it's, it's such a masterwork that it, you know, you can take it on so many different levels. Well, and I think uh, 
while we're on the topic of children's books, uh, there is one that's called What is a World? That is an amazing collaboration of Black Mountain College uh, alums, and Ray for that did the end papers. John Cage did the paper snowflakes, I think, that appear. And Remy's involved in it, too. And it's just... Norman has a hand in it okay. as well, Norman Solomon. Yeah, so there's... That's, that's a big area here. Um, I don't know where it fits in, exactly. Uh, in the historical record you've gathered, you have a few uh, audio pieces. There's one that, uh, and I'm not sure I quite understand it, but it sounds like somebody's going to take it for me, maybe over a phone. Uh, tombstone or something. Oh, Sal on the tombstone. It, it's Dick reciting his own poem. But who's he reciting it to? We don't know. It's a recording at the, found at Bill Wilson's on uh, one of those old reel to reel tapes, the really the giant ones. Um, who the identity of you hear her voice a little bit at the beginning. Um, in the original tape there's a longer conversation before, uh, but nobody nobody knows who she is. But he's he it sounds like I'm not sure if he's dictating the poem because he's adding the punctuation. Or yeah. it was um uh, apparently, this the woman that he's talking to is working on a, an anthology of poetry, and there isn't time for Dick to mail her this poem, so he's dictating it for her to write down at the end. So yes, he does go through. He's very specific about the, the punctuation, the, the line breaks, and, and so forth, which is great because it gives us a, a very clear record of what the poem would have been. There's no there's no evidence that it was ever published any place. It may, that we have found that so we far have found too late. <laughs> but all those disclaimers, it's very possible. But in all the searching, we've never found. Also, the Cipollone and Estuary letters there are, are, are poems by, um, there's a, there are three typescripts that aren't here, and there's one just in his handwriting. That seems to be a Dick Higgins poem or series of poems that also don't, don't appear to have been published in any place. It's, it's so weird because it's, a, it's almost like a performance because the person who he's dictating to is in the room and you know, he could just kind of hand it to her. You know. No, they're on the phone. So they're on the phone. Yeah, yeah. So and she needs to have this poem uh, okay. on a deadline of some sort. Um, but like I said, it makes it really fascinating because you're, you're hearing all of these, all of these decisions of his. Do you want to say something more too about the audio in the exhibit? Um, the, the three performance pieces that are part of that um, for, are from a, a cassette tape that was found at the estate of Ray Johnson a couple of years ago. And um, uh, there's a letter that, that you can see on the, on the little screen um, by Dick describing what's on the tape. But it's really interesting if we look at Ray's chronology. We don't see the, the, the titles are there. There's, it doesn't seem like he ever performed them in public, or if he did, we just don't know when that was, and it's not on his. It's not on his resume yet on his chronology, even though he's been working on chronology since he died. Um, so some of the pieces we see that they were performed by other people. There's no record of them ever having been performed by Ray himself. Whether we're hearing actual performances on that tape or whether it's Ray just by himself with Dick in a tape recorder, um, there's no way of knowing. It mentions one piece called She Has Red Hair, and that there's no reference to that I've ever found to that performance any place else. Um, he says that it's a, a collaboration with Earl Brown, um, but it is, except for he has it on the tape and the, the mention in that letter, that piece could, could not exist. Well, and I think, too, the, the really unique, the, there's funeral music for Elvis Presley, right? I think I have the title right. Um, I've read about that. I've seen it mentioned places. This is the first chance I've ever gotten to hear it. And this is the first chance these have been kind of publicly shared in some way, or even digitized. So um, it's this is, don't miss this part, <laughs> because it's a really unique opportunity. I have never heard it myself until I got a DVD to send here for this show. Tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a quick question. How did the, the envelope of production materials get to Bill? 
I hate to say that I don't know so many times in, in, in one short panel, but uh, it's unclear how <laughs> that happened exactly. It, Bill does not remember. It could either have been Dick that brought the envelope over, or it could have been Ray that brought the envelope over. Um, it's really hard to say. Who, if Ray had the envelope after, oh, I, I, I don't. That doesn't sound like it would be a Dick Higgins thing to do to give Ray the, the paper state production materials after. There was no original artwork because that all went someplace else. Um, Ray did move from New York from a very small apartment uh, out to, um, to Long Island in 1968. Maybe he was trying to downsize and, and it was time to give things away to Bill Wilson. But uh, there's, no, there's no way of knowing from the envelope or from how the contents are arranged or anything. Now my memory of this is fuzzy, so this is thinking aloud, ask my, me asking Michael. But isn't there some sort of physical proximity of where something else press was located in relation to Bill's apartment? Is it? They were far away, but I mean, okay. in Manhattan. I just can't yeah, remember. Yeah. I thought there was something that was a, a little closer, but my, my memory is easy. No, no, not that I know. Okay. Does the Ray Johnson State have a band-aid or a mission in a way that, like, for example, um, there are differences. I don't, Diana. <laughs> um, basically, our mission is to preserve what's in the estate and Ray Johnson's legacy to promote him and his art. There's no sort of charitable mission. Well, what that collection is, is um, when, when Ray died without a will, um, it was the contents of, of his apartment, I mean, uh, of, of his house, which was stuffed, <laughs> stuffed, and staged for the people that would, after his body washed up, he knew that, that police were gonna open the house and some unfortunate friends were gonna be the first ones, and so there are portraits of Ray looking across the room at another portrait of Ray, and lots of creepy stuff. This, this, the documentary gets into that a lot, so it will give you some good visuals if you haven't seen them. Yeah, there was a lot about the, um, you know, why didn't he leave the will? If he if he thought down to the, he had 13 cents pocket change and, and was it checked into a motel that the digits on the door added up to 13. He did all of this super specific stuff, except not do anything about what his legacy would be afterwards. And so the estate of Ray Johnson is, it's a very large expenditure to all of the processing and the archiving and stuff like that with um, you know with the hope of, of, of financial gain I guess but it is mostly it is mostly a labor of love to to, to keep Ray's memory alive and, and help people to know who he was I think too maybe we should now now more of us know the name Ray Johnson um, and for anyone who's like don't worry you know if you go outside this room or this this town, you know, like it gets it fewer and fewer, but people people know, and um, I think that there's something of in the 1960s, the New York Times critic Grace Fluitt, you know, wrote an article and calls him the most famous unknown artist. So there's always this challenge for him during his life with recognition, and I don't know what that means at the end, but I do. I think he would be delighted with the attention he's getting today, though I'm sure it would not be as simple as that. Um, but I think there's something though, he wanted, he wanted people to get or respond in some way. We see that he wanted people maybe to respond or, because he would respond to people. So if he didn't want that, and I think the one thing of of certain things that are in archives or certain books that get published or, or things like that allow more people to encounter him and cross paths. And I think he's really very much one of those artist artists that artists really respond to him. Um, anyone I think can respond because if you like peanut butter sandwiches, Ray Johnson's the artist for you. If you like donuts, even there's donut references. If you like, um, 
you know, eggs, we have egg references. You know, I mean, and that's kind of making light, but it's not. There's a, there's lots of ways into Ray Johnson, I think. Um, but I do think he was hoping someone would pay attention at some point, um, more than they maybe were during his life. That's my view. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There are probably just as many theories uh, on some topics like that as there are people that know about Ray Johnson. And, <laughs> and has Everyone been, has a different perspective. And, and there's this thing of knowing what you don't know. There are just things that you're not ever going to know. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Donald Trump's stuff. What do you think you do with Facebook? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard to say. That is an interesting one. I, those of us um, who were who were born before the Facebook phenomenon uh, view it very differently. And maybe having been born in 1927 is probably going to have a very a very different take on it. Also, there was the story of. of Betty White gets to host Saturday Night Live. And there's this Facebook campaign, and she said, "So oh, I never knew what Facebook was until there was this campaign to get me on Saturday Night Live." And uh, golly, now that I know what it is, I think it sounds like such a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's something, though, in what Ray did and the networks of people that he created, and then also too in Warhol circles and Warhol's, you know, all the superstars and that sort of thing, that is what Facebook becomes. You know, there's, and I'm not saying, but sometimes things get figured out in art before they're figured out in science, or before, so I think there's, there's things that could be said if someone wanted to kind of look at networks in certain ways, or circles, and then how people get connected to each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, 95 is when he, he kills himself, and that's around the time the internet's really taking off. I don't know. Speculation. Yeah. But John Hill, John Hill said at one of the conferences that uh, he was sure that for Ray, the correspondence work was not about the U.S. Postal Service. It was about communication, whatever, whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. So no, I, that, that would seem to be a, a, a good assessment of things. There's another layer of, of Ray that, that isn't really in evidence in this show because um, well, because the, the show can't be everything Ray Johnson did. But, um, you know, there, there's a, the Ray Johnson quote-unquote legendary story. So he brings his friend Dorothy Potter to Andy Warhol's studio. She's mentioned here. And, and uh, she, when no one's looking, she reaches into her purse and she takes out a pistol and she fires at, there are four, there are five, oh, yeah. the famous Marilyn Monroe silk screens. And, and he puts a bullet hole through, uh, through four of them, five of them, and they become the famous Marilyn shot Marilyn <laughs> afterwards. Um, uh, the, um, the gun that shot Andy Warhol was stored under May Wilson's bed for, for a while. And um, the, the Valerie Solanas came one day and said, oh, I, need my, I need my stuff back from under your bed. And May Wilson has to give her this bag knowing that there's a gun in it. She goes right from there and she shoots Andy Warhol, Ray's friend. Um, so the, yeah, there are, we don't go into a lot of that in this show, but there's a there's a whole other um, there's a whole other side which is Ray was there in the 1960s when a lot of stuff was happening. Um, in my research, gosh, people go in and out of mental institutions and they shoot things and they shoot each other and they disappear into Scientology, leaving infant children behind forever. Um, their kids die in accidents that I wish I didn't know about. They're so awful. A lot of stuff happens then, and it's part of the Ray Johnson mystique as well. Um, I've always tried to not let it become the focus of my work on Ray, although it's always there in the back. I think, too, another thing, just as if we're touching on the topic of computers, Ray's good friend, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Millicent, no, no, it's, um, no, it's, which one works for IBM? 
Oh, Toby Spiesel. Toby Spiesel, sorry. Name uh, soup. Uh, Toby Spiesel and works for IBM. So Ray is kind of around computers in this really removed sort of way. But there, isn't there like the, the paper, the printout paper? He was doing some Gerber plotter sort of thing. So, you know, I think there's something of this is a moment too where computers are rising, and I think some people engage with certain things, but there, there might be more in there than we realize. Um, I don't know. Um, there's something else we thinking about. I think that your point about art and science, I think that's very relevant here about certain ideas because he's a precursor of this whole idea of Facebook, but he comes from the Black Mountain experience of this communication between disciplines and, and then he just attunes it, that's his niche that he goes into. Just like Van Der Beek and what he was doing, he prefigured this baby internet and the, the global experience. So there's something about the Black Mountain experience that fires up these people to, to, to uh, that, that goes out into the world. I, I think your point is. I think, yeah, when you're given the space to be creative and innovative and you're in a supportive environment, amazing things that can happen. There's also failures, as we know. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Buckminster Mr. Fuller, and I'm sure one poster child for failure um, in the best ways, you know, but then the next year, that dome is up. Um, so I think the one thing I know what I was gonna get back to this Facebook thing, not that we're trying to, but I also think there is a very important aspect to the object. So I'm not sure, um, and just kind of that moment of getting something in the mail and the moment of opening the envelope and and kind of being reading the newspaper, seeing something that reminds you of someone, cutting it out, sending it to that person, or sending it to someone else, asking them to send it to someone else. So there's all of that kind of daily improvisation that's a part of what Ray did and how Ray acted that is very inspired by actual things in the world. So I'm not sure, I, I, I just do think that was, they're, they're important triggers. But. Cornell is doing this too, right? Cornell does collages and objects and gives sense of them to people. Joseph Cornell, yeah. 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 Well, and so there's actually this caveman uh, that Ray finds and he had used, I think, in a collage and it's the same caveman that Cornell used in the collage. Um, and, and Ray and Joseph Cornell were in touch with some correspondence in the archives of American art between the two of them. Um, I don't have a ton more, but it would be fascinating to know if one of them sent something to each other. <laughs> what, what oh, they did have mailed exchanges, yeah. So. And I don't, I mean, Cornell also has all those great books that he collaged all sorts of things in in his collection. And that's, you know, just that collage book that Ray has some of those. I don't think they knew about them because I think those are found after um, Cornell's death. But, um, yeah. So I think we probably should shut it down with a profound thought. What, what, what should we know from both of you to end the... Well, you have a couple more images on here. Do you want to run through those? Um, well, yeah, I think maybe this can be my profound thought and uh, my wish uh, for books. Um, I, I still don't think I have all the answers by any means worked out, but Ray engaged with books a lot and really kind of the creative form that the book can take. Um, and this is one of them. This is called The Book of... Oops, I put the too many slides. The month. And so you only know it's the book of the month when you moved each page and look at all of them. Maybe we should look at the next one too. Um, this is the peak of the week book. Oh, I might have done these images slightly wrong. This is the peak of book, you know, the book of the week. Um, so this, I, and then we see these great holes too, which Susie Gablick had her fingers through the holes in the Medicus photograph. Um, so I think, and, you know, and I think there's something that's really fantastic that this is a book that even 50 years later after it was published, it's on the shelves of some libraries and people can go to that book and they can still engage with this. And so I think for me it's just that Ray had a relationship to books in some really interesting and creative ways. Um, and I think for me the paper snake, 
is this great way for maybe people to discover or encounter Ray, um, even if they're at the library. And he worked at the Detroit Public Library um, when he was in high school. So um, something for someone to, to dive into deeper. <laughs> I think the paper snake is, um, uh, in many ways, it's typical of the whole Ray Johnson suit. There's no, there are no answer, easy answers. There are lots and lots of dangling questions. Uh, there, there are things about it that, that um, are contradictory to, to some basic things about Ray's working and, and so forth. It's problematic. In, in, so many ways that to focus on, on just that bit for me for the last 16 months being able to put all, a lot of the other Ray Johnson stuff aside and just delve into to, to see how mysterious something like a single book can be. It turns out to be far more complicated than I could ever have imagined. And this exhibition, uh, there's a lot about the book in it. It could be, I have a binder full of images that it's much bigger. A, a lot more research, I still don't understand. <laughs> <laughs>